Welcome back to my mental health and crime channel. My name is Huda London. I'm a licensed cognitive behavior therapist. That's a CBT therapist and a licensed mental health counselor. This is for entertainment purpose only. Please like, share, and subscribe. May the victims rest in peace. This is one of the police body cams that has ne never sat well with me. I do not like to talk bad about any victims, but since this is a quadruple murder case, we need to analyze this a bit. This was the second time the police came to this residence Actually, the third time, I believe, that night. They spoke to Madison Morgan on the phone once. When the officers came to this noise complaint from the neighbors, I assume, Zano Knodel, may she rest in peace, opened the door. I couldn't ignore this as a therapist, honestly. I personally believe that Zana could have been tired, but something is not right in this picture. When Zana speaks, her speech is very slow. seems like she's allegedly she could be on medications or possibly drugs hate to say that what is the thing that surprises me is that these police with the body cams, have come a couple of times to this house at the same night. They seem to be just giving warnings and nothing else. I'm sure a police officer is well trained to see the pupils of somebody's eyes. How, the manner they speak in and certain kind of behaviors. Zana opened the door and she spoke to the officer and let's watch this closely. Pay attention to her movements, the way she speaks. She could just be tired we can clearly see that this is a bit more than tiredness. Turn the music down. Turn the music down. Hey guys, second time. I need one. I need somebody to come to the door. Music stays off. Party's over. Megan, I have her information. I have her cell phone number too. Megan, I have her information. I have her cell phone number too. Okay. Hello, miss. What's your name? Zana. Zana, do you live here? Yes. Hey, did Megan talk to you earlier? I know. Okay, does Megan live here? Megan, I do not have a Megan that lives Megan here. Mogan? Madden Mogan, yes. Madison Mogan? Yes. Madison Mogan? Okay, she does Sorry, live here. Sorry, we... She is at the club. She's 21. I'm just going to bed. 
I have a couple of friends over, but okay. this is my idea. Did, have you talked to Maddie tonight? Yes, I have. Oh. She's at the cl corner club. Okay. Did she did she tell you anything about anything that happened earlier or anything like that? Honestly, not really. I'm I've just been here the past hour. Okay. Okay. Just trying to go to bed. Can I grab your ID for me? If yeah, right I'm right. not 21. I'm, okay. My roommates are 21. I just well, need to go to bed. We're, we're not here for we're not here to talk about the alcohol stuff, okay? Okay, yeah. Um, but th this is the second noise complaint we've had here tonight within two hours. I'm sorry. Okay. About that. So this time it was the blonde gal and the guy on the back porch playing music. Okay. So I sincerely apologize about that. Okay. I, I'm just going to bed. Okay. So, so just so you understand, you could be getting a misdemeanor citation for this, which means you have to go in front of a judge. And explain why you couldn't keep the people in your house quiet. Okay. We've already talked to Maddie once and told her the same thing. Okay. The only reason she's not getting a ticket is because she's not standing here in front of me. But I'm telling you right now, if we have to come back, you're getting a ticket. Okay. So you I'm You will have to go right see a now. judge. I'm fine right now. You're not getting a ticket right now. I'm just trying to go to bed right okay. now. I mean, I, I understand you guys. You're coming here. I'm, I'm just going to bed. Okay. Well, understand that you're responsible for the residents. Okay. So, whoever else is here, if they have a safe way to get home, you need to kick them out. Okay. Or tell them to come inside and be quiet. Because okay. the houses that are on this hill all the way around here, we can hear you from clear down the road when we were coming up here. We can hear the music. Okay. And that's, I'm so sorry. We're, we're past the point of having polite conversations, okay? Because yeah. so neighbors sorry. are being kept up. Okay? I'm sorry. It's just yeah. like... Is the, the blonde gal and the guy up there, are they roommates too? I'm sorry, what? The, the blonde gal and the, the guy that's upstairs, are they roommates too? None of my roommates are home. I oh, okay. Home. That was interesting. The officer asked Zano, may she rest in peace, if the blonde girl and the blonde guy upstairs live there too. We know that this house had five roommates. They all were girls. So is the officer talking about Eaton? I don't think so because Eaton is clearly not blonde. He has brownish hair. I wonder if Hunter Johnson was there, which he usually was there. What was exactly going on in this house that the officers missed? I'm just asking as a therapist. There are clear signs of these are young college students and if they came to this house twice within two hours, they spoke, they spoke to Maddie, Madison Morgan over the phone the first time. We had Hunter Johnson and a blonde guy opened the door, I believe they were from Sigma Chi fraternity or other fraternities, and they clearly said they did not know who lived here. So this house does honestly have traffic. What kind of traffic? We wouldn't know. But do not forget that the police has said in the beginning of this case that either it was the residents or it was the occupants of this house who were the targets. What was going on in this house for the police to have missed it or for the police not to have taken it seriously when there are so many neighbors complaining? That makes me think of one thing. If complaints was coming from neighbors who had to go to college or who had to go to work, or who had children, because there were all kinds of people, this was an off-campus house. So if neighbors keep on calling the police, and if they don't feel like much is being done, is it possible that one of the neighbors could have taken things in their own hands? Since this house had, let's be honest, may the rest in peace, but we need to figure this out. Since this house had 
parties very often, especially weekends and weekdays. We have many people saying that. It was a party house. We were the news channel saying that. So this is not something that social media only says. So if this party, if this house was a party house, I believe many people had motive. People who entered this house, who partied in this house, neighbors who found the noise complaint to be too much, anyone could have done anything because it was said that the house or the occupants living in the house were the targets. Zana could have just had a long day and she could have been tired. But in cognitive behavior, we look at how a person talks, their behavior pattern, and other things. I'm not an expert in analyzing someone. I don't know. But it's clear to see when somebody is not completely sober. We know when people drink how they behave and how their speech turns, but this looks like more than drinking. What was actually going on in this house? We heard, was his name Harvey's turn or Harvey, Harvey's turn on the 48 hours saying that drugs could be a motive. Since I've been speaking about this case of Ido Moscow, you'll have noticed I don't mention drugs and I do not like to make it a motive or talk about it because these innocent victims are dead. But to get justice for them, we need to find out exactly what was going on in this house for the house or for the occupants of the house to have been the targets. Was there any drug debts owed in this house? Was somebody in this house dealing with illegal substance? The reason I ask is we have clearly seen Emma Bailey in this house. And we know what Emma ba Bailey deals with. In case you all do not know, Emma Bailey and her boyfriend, Demetrius Robinson, sold drugs to our young 19-year-old man, a student who overdosed of it was laced with fentanyl we don't know how or what happened but the case was dismissed and they weren't arrested nobody knows the reason but we know clearly that they were taken to court for that and they were arrested in the beginning. Once you see Emma ba Bailey walking into this house, which we've seen, it obviously brings questions. We've seen Emma Bailey on the body cam of Washington Pullman when she was arrested and when she was supposed to be talking to a lawyer in the private room, she clearly took something from y'all know where, from her backside, and she threw it in the bin. She looks like somebody who has a criminal background, who knows a lot about drugs and deals with drugs, because we clearly know that a young man overdosed. What was Emma Bailey doing into this in this house? Who was she friends with? Allegedly, there was rumors that she was friends with the sixth occupant, the sixth roommate in this house, for whatever reason, wasn't living there anymore. We've seen Emma Bailey taking pictures with Dylan Mortison, the surviving roommate. 
what was going on in this house. The officers looking directly into Zana's eyes. Can't he notice there's something clearly not right? Wouldn't it have been fair for the officer to call his chief and get a warrant to search the house? Because to start with, they have a good reason to get a warrant because this house has a lot of complaints from the neighbors. The music is loud. You'll heard the officer saying clearly that the music is heard way down the hills. They keep on, the officers keep on saying, you will get a citation for this. What is the citation? Why don't they warn them that you will get arrested and we will come and check in the property what exactly is going on? But I don't know how officers in Ido Moscow work because clearly I can talk about the country I live in and I know in London this would have been a serious matter. You would have got all the police coming in with a warrant or kicking in the door to find out what is exactly going on that this house has so much complaints. And that could have actually saved the four victims. If these parties were stopped, if these students were reported to the campus, if they were reported to the deans and to the principals, even if they were kicked out from the university, they still would have been alive. I'm being honest. More could have been done, more should have been done, and I don't understand why nothing was done. When Hunter Johnson opened the door and his other friend who doesn't even know who the house belongs to, he said he doesn't know who lives here. That is serious. Remember the police officer asked him, so would that say you're trespassing? So he said, no, it's just that I don't know who lives here. I live across the street and the people who live here are parting somewhere else. So that means this house had access. Anyone could have had access to come in and out of the house. Forget going through a sliding door. People had the key pad number of getting into this house. And this is really disappointing that law enforcement took it lightly. These are young students. We know what college stu students are up to. But when you get a complaint from a certain house very often, and it was called the party house, why wasn't the party shut down? These four students' lives could have been saved. With a serious warning, the police should have shut down the parties. Police, law and enforcement are made for certain standards. The standards is to keep the peace, but the neighbors are being disturbed. Their job is to make sure that illegal substance is not going on. Allegedly. I'm not saying that it's a guarantee or it's a fact that Zana was on something, but you can clearly see if you look and analyze properly, Zana could have been on prescription drugs too. But still she was on something. Her speech was really slow and dull. She was dragging her words. I do understand that she's paranoid. Her, she's anxious because the police have been there the second time. But you can see that something is clearly wrong. So what was going on in this house? Now you have another body cam here from the undercover police.
this was the same night the horrific quadruple murders happened. You can see the timing was at 11 past 3. This is when you have the four figures running behind. These three young men, I've mentioned that thousands of times, ran away from the police. The police asked them to stop, but they ran away. They walked on until the officer, you can see the officer here with his torch, had to run after them and literally tell them to stop. And they still didn't stop till he reached, till he caught up to them. While these young students running away from the police, what do they have to hide? What is happening in Idol Moscow? Just a question. The way I usually know, if the police tells you to stop and you run away, you get arrested. And they check you. They check your pockets to find out why were you running away from them? Who runs away from cops? Someone who has something to hide usually. Whether it's a weapon, whether it's drugs, whether it's illegal substance, whatever. If you have nothing to hide, you wouldn't run away from the police. So what are these three gentlemen acting suspicious about running or walking away from the police the middle one has his hands in his pocket. The other one has his hands crossed. He hardly puts his hands down. Look at his shirt. Look at his pants, the one in the corner. He looks like the clothes are too small for him. He has on female clothes. If you ask me, people could say, so think otherwise. But we all analyze things from a different way. Where were these three young men running from? Where were they running? And I wonder what they threw, threw in the field. Because they refused to stop and it was dark and the police brought them back to this stop. But they walked a further distance inside the field. So we don't know what they could have thrown. Whether it's a weapon. This young man has on vans, the pair of shoes. Wasn't that the latent print that was found in front of Dylan Mortison, his room? I find this to be very... I don't even know the right words to say. I don't find this to be right. All these body cams speak a thousands of words. It says a lot. Actions speak, to, speak louder than words. So it's clear for me to see that these students did not fear law enforcement. The fraternities and the Greek style life have this code of not snitching on each other, not calling the police. So if anyone knew what was exactly going on, they wouldn't have called the police. I personally believe these three men should have been arrested, should have been checked from head to toe, and especially after the quadruple murders, after the quadruple murders, the police should have investigated this body cam, but it's too late. Whatever they threw, they threw. They could have thrown a weapon, gone back next day and collected it. This, they could have dispersed the evidence, clearly. Okay, it's an accident. Let's not panic, you know. And I remember texting Kaylee. <laughs> this 
seat it feels okay. And she obviously didn't ever respond. So it was in the morning. Y'all heard that clearly. This is Eva, Kaylee, his best friend. She said, I thought, let's not panic. It could have been an accident or something. She said she called Kaylee's phone. There was no answer. And this was 10 a.m. in the morning. So why did the surviving roommates call the police at 11.58, two minutes to noon? Eva knew about the quadruple murders at 10 a.m., two hours before the police knew. Many other students knew at 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. What is going on? What exactly is going on here? Let's not panic, you know. And I remember texting Kaylee. <laughs> and see if she was okay. <laughs> and she obviously didn't ever respond. So it was in the morning. I have a question. Eva, if you knew about it at 10 a.m. in the morning, why didn't you call the police? Clearly, the two surviving roommates did not call the police. Kaylee was your best friend. Is it because you all have the code not to snitch? So you all clearly knew that a quadruple murder happened. By not calling the police is actually a crime. That's a felony. So what was going on? I'm sure if they knew it was Brian Koberger who did these horrific crimes, they would have called the police immediately because he's from Washington Pullman. They wouldn't have had a problem snitching on him, I doubt. Allegedly, that's my opinion. So was it someone in the fraternities or the sororities the Greek lifestyle, who knew about this, who knew who was involved, and is that the reason they didn't call the police? Just a question. This is not the first person you knew about the quadruple murders at 10 a.m. So ever, by law, it's your duty to call the police. This was a quadruple murder. Everybody in Idaho, Moscow knew, the Sigma Chi boys knew since they came and opened the door and saw Zana and Eaton allegedly unconscious, although it was a bloody crime scene. That is the reason I say it was somebody, I personally believe, who knew the students. It was the people parting in the house. This could have had anything to do allegedly with money, with illegal substance, with revenge. Whatever was going on was known by the students and by the friends of Kaylee. So why haven't these people called the police? Why aren't they releasing the 911 call? Don't you find that interesting? Is it because more secrets will come out? So this is no longer about the surviving roommates. This is about close friends knew before the police. The police were the last ones to know. I don't blame the police, but I blame them because they should have shut down these parties long time ago. We have the young boy, Hudson, who was found in the creek. 
in January 2022, we have this young girl, Hannah Clee, who died allegedly of an overdose and her body was found three days later after her father made a welfare call. We have a quadruple murder here. So what's going on? This sounds like whatever happens in Ido Moscow stays in Ido Moscow. This is another body cam. Although this is daytime. Kaylee's here and we have Hunter Johnson here. Hunter Johnson practically lived in this house. He seems to be the doorman opening the door every time the police knock. Let's not forget he was called before the police when the four students were found brutally murdered. If the students knew about this quadruple murder in the morning around 8, 9 and 10, like we've heard, don't you think that the bodies were tampered with? Hunter took the pulse, I believe, of Eaton or Zana. So that means the victims' bodies were touched. Were the victims' bodies moved? We wouldn't know. Because the police were called eight hours later. I believe there's more to this case. I've never said that Brian Koberger is innocent. And I've never said Brian Koberg is guilty. But I personally believe it's somebody who knew these students. Somebody who used to party in this house. Whether it was about money, illegal substance, revenge, hate, jealousy, whatever was going on was from locals was somebody who had access to this house. Maybe the surviving roommates were threatened not to speak, or maybe they didn't call law enforcement on purpose. You never know what was going on. And then you have creators coming with false information from Hunter Johnson and the, what are they called, the fraternities, the Sigma Chi, spreading misinformation and false information to certain YouTube creators who do not understand that you're not supposed to be talking or working or getting any information from people who may be called to the trial as witness. Hunter will be called because he touched the bodies. Hunter will be called because he was called to the scene by the surviving roommates. Why is the fraternity boys telling Watt's obsession about who was called, what Bethany saw? That is putting Bethany Funk's life in danger. She's a surviving roommate. Her case is on a gag order. We need to be mindful about that. The two Davids, David Lodge and the David B, allegedly from the Fortran Post, we know that predicted how they were going to do this. The Sigma Chi was under investigation the first couple of weeks. Allegedly, they don't have cameras, so they couldn't see who left and who was at home the whole night. Four figures were running from this direction to that direction in Sigma Chi. The ones crossing the field in the band field, Alcor Minosops, were from some other fraternity 
I know Saeed is from Sigma Chi. These people were sending each other Venmos or not, weren't they? This isn't adding up. And this is going to be interesting when the trial starts. I want to hear the 911 call. I think there's something about the 911 call that they're not releasing. I think the 911 call will tell us exactly what happened and it may end up clearing Brian Koberger. Or it may end up showing that Brian Koberger was involved with the help of others. We have all these parties going on. This is the neighbors of the victims. We don't know what was going on in Ido Moscow. That's all I can say. You have even a sofa up on the roof. How interesting. If anyone was involved, allegedly, they could have come from this house, they could have come from the Sigma Chi, allegedly, they could have come from any of these nearby areas. Didn't Jack D live around here? And I've always said whoever did this horrific quadruple murders knew Murphy, knew the dog. The dog did not have one trace of blood on him. We've heard rumors that the dog was taken out of the house. Don't know, but it's very interesting. Why haven't the prosecution turned over the DNA from the crime scene? It was run through a public genealogical database. Call 911. We're learning that the caller was not, Rakit, not either of the two roommates who live in the house and apparently slept through the massacre. So the mystery is, who did make that 911 call to police and how did that person make the gruesome discovery? I spoke with County Prosecutor Bill Thompson. It's an essential part of the case. Uh, whoever discovered the scene first, whoever initiated the contact with law enforcement is all part of understanding what occurred and the timeline of what occurred. He told me the two roommates may have critical information. The investigators are already talking to him and trying to um, get from them everything they can possibly remember about what they may have seen, what they may have heard. Uh, what their activities were, what they know about the activities of their housemates. A new wrinkle, former LAPD detective Mark Furman, yes, that Mark Furman from the O.J. Simpson trial, now lives in Idaho and is claiming that victim Kaylee Gonsalves had a stalker. I talked to one student, and I agree with this, it was twice removed from the person that said it, Kaylee, but Kaylee two months ago complained about a stalker. Only when I this social media video shows all five women in the kitchen of the house they shared. We're learning that the killer, for some reason, bypassed the rooms where the two young survivors were sleeping. Their story was, is they heard partying, they heard noise, but they just, as usual, said, you know, there's partying going on, they locked the door. Another mystery, where was Kaylee's dog the night of the killing? Why didn't his barking wake everyone up? Autopsies on the four students found each had multiple stab wounds. Some had defensive wounds, showing they fought with the attacker. And there was no sexual assault. County coroner Kathy Mabbott is describing the murders as personal. Were they found in beds? Um, yes. There were multiple stab wounds. The fatal ones were to the chest area or the upper body area. The father of Zana Kernodal says her wounds show she fought for her life. Bruises and just, you know, maybe curved by the knife or whatever. Yeah. She She's a tough kid. Whatever she wanted to do, she, she could do it. And we're learning that another victim, Madison Mogan, had planned to spend Thanksgiving with the family of her boyfriend, Jake Schreiger. His mother says his world has been turned upside down. 
There's growing anger over the progress of the investigation in Moscow, Idaho. Madison Mogan's aunt says the lack of information, statements from left field, and lack of outreach to the public to gain information has made this even more painful. On a typical weeknight, Main Street in this small college town is bustling, but not tonight. So many people are fearful over these four brutal homicides that many students have left campus and returned home, leaving Moscow, Idaho, a virtual ghost town. I found University of Idaho student Grace Martin, who lives across the street from the murder scene, as she joined the exodus of students heading home. Living next to the crime scene, it feels very dark, like there's like kind of a a spirit of death around a bit. Abigail Spencer, news editor of the campus newspaper, says the lack of information is fueling fear. They keep saying it's an isolated incident, but if we don't have an idea of who it is, nobody knows what to look out for, and no one knows how to keep themselves and their friends and family safe. I wonder if the detectives found a clue here. Maybe the access for the suspect or suspects to have come into the house because you can see clearly three of them are pointing their fingers in one direction. 